Well, this is an exciting one for me. Welcome back, everybody. I would say that for the last decade, maybe a dozen years or so, uh, right around the time that I put out the original printed wrestling card price guide, I started to hear the name David Peck in the hobby. Some dude that was down in, in, the, in the lower states and he was buying up the, all these Hulk Hogan all-stars and all of a sudden he was talking about them on the uh, on the forums and holding the flag for wrestling. I'm like, who is this guy? You know, where is this guy? And what's he doing? And I sort of, oh, I see. He's buying up all the early stuff. He's getting it graded as high as he can. Smart. At the time, I was still a completist trying to fill out as much as I could. Um, and during that time, you know, we, 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 we speak every so often, like online. And, um, you know, we've recently, since the, the, the hobby uh, getting more popular, we've been more in touch with each other. But I, I have to say, this is the first time ever. Now, Tony, it's not the same for you because you've been doing this for quite a while. But despite our many conversations, back and forth, uh, you know, almost daily on, on X. Uh, this is the first time that Mr. David Peck and myself get to meet face to face. So welcome, brother. Um, finally, nice to do this for real instead of back and forth. Now, for those of you guys that don't know who this gentleman is, and I doubt there's very many of you that don't. Yeah, um, get out like from whatever rock you're under. Exactly. <laughs> um, like I say, David was one of the flag bearers for our hobby, sort of around 2010-ish. And uh, um, and really push the hobby forward, especially with his collection. Um, it's, you know, it's generally recognized that David's wrestling card collection is the most valuable in the hobby. Um, it's made up primarily of high-grade Hogan's, um, a lot of rookies. Then he's got stuff like um, uh, assigned Donald Trump, uh, assigned Mike Tyson Italian, um, the, the kind of stuff that's, you know, real big money, you know, like, David, David, if he was to sell one or two cards, would uh, eclipse the value of most of our, our collections. Now, um, because of the uh, uh, extent of, of the collection, I think, and, and the work that you've done, David, in the hobby, you've essentially become perhaps the most noticeable name or most recognizable name in the hobby. I mean, there's guys like me and Tony and Zan and Gelman and all the rest of us. But I think it's safe to say that in general, just in terms of your presence on social media and everything else, that you're kind of the you know, we don't like to say that there's a leader in the hobby, but you're certainly at the top or, you know, the top with, with a handful of other ones. Um, so, we, you know, you, you normally get sort of lumped into that vintage crowd talking about the all-stars and the PSA stuff, but that's not you at all. I mean, I know full well that you know the hobby as well as Tony and I do, top to bottom. So if you guys are thinking that this is another chat about David Peck and all-stars, it's not. We're going to be talking uh, in this session about everything to do with wrestling cards because this guy knows it all. So once again, welcome, David. You know, we've got a, a bunch of top topics to go through. The first thing we're going to talk about is sort of a macro topic, and that's just about the hobby in general. Now, we've Tony and I have talked on recent shows that the market in general is down, but we feel that wrestling, that might not be the case. So let's, let's start there. Let's, let's, let's hear uh, David Peck's synopsis on the wrestling market and the, how about first we say, Hey David, how you doing? Hey David, it's Tony <laughs> Bella. What's going on guys? Um, you know, the, the, the card market's kind of uh, strange right now because I think there's um, seasonal factors at play. Um, it, it started collecting uh, in 2009 and, really kind of noticed that auctions around the holiday season uh, get kind of soft. And I think that that's, um, it makes sense. This is a discretionary hobby for most people. Uh, what's kind of interesting though, in the last couple of years, you've seen a large emergence of people that are sort of trying to make the hobby like a profession, right? So, so maybe some of that cyclicality um, isn't quite the same, but it feels like, it. you know, I've been seeing lots of um, kind of soft, auctions lately and i think we're um but on the flip side like really good stuff is still selling strong you know so like just the other day and i posted it uh there was like a randy savage uh opichi um i'll use the word rookie because i think it's a rookie um you know in a nine sold for it said fifteen hundred dollars on the flip side you know a seven right now might be thirty five dollars you know so the, the the good stuff seems like there's um a lot of interest. You know, what's also kind of interesting is that I've noticed just the, 
the, the total volume is down right now. Uh, when you look at, uh, so I do searches every day um, to I do PSA wrestling is my primary search because I wanted to see what, what stuff's going for. Um, and, you know, you're just seeing less, less volume. But in times past, what I noticed is once you get into like February and March, people start getting tax returns. Um, they've made it through the holidays and um, and the market picks up. And, you know, that may also coincide with the baseball season. You know, um, baseball is obviously the most heavily collected type of card. Um, but wrestling's made so much progress. Like, quite frankly, I'm very proud of where we're at. You know, we've come from basically – you know, being in the basement to, you know, now we're at the table and um, it feels good. And, you know, I think that a lot of people don't uh, realize that, you know, folks like yourselves uh, and myself, you know, we have been trying to push this forward for a long time. I mean, I, you, you put in out the price guide, um, Tony with the wrestling trading cards website. I mean, I've referred so many people to that website over the years uh, PSA, and I, I, I assume the other grading companies use it as a resource for some of their checklists. So um, there's a lot of knowledge uh, on the line today. Um, and there's a lot of people uh, like us that are consistently trying to get the message out that wrestling cards are cool. I mean, uh, you put a report out a couple weeks ago showing uh, across the board all the different sectors of the hobby, all the different sports, non-sports like that. Wrestling is the only thing in the current market right now that is in the green. Everything else is in the red because it's such a soft market right now. Um, there's just something about wrestling that's always been different. And uh, like you said, David, uh, you know, the higher end stuff is going to continue to keep at that high end level, it appears. And the low end stuff is, you know, it's a buyer's market right now for that kind of stuff. So it, the, uh, the market's always been like this. I've been preaching that for years and years. You know, holidays are always tough, as you said, because, uh, you know, I, I don't know what David has in his collection. So therefore, I'm not buying him anything for Christmas for that. Um, and then you get you get tax return money, you know, February, March like that. Um, it's always been that way as far as long as for as long as I've had an eBay account, you know, since the late 90s. Uh, it's it's always been like that for me. Um, so I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's just kind of weird because it's not like I sort of sought out that information it's just more anecdotal and when you see that pattern sort of over and over again you know it makes sense i think the difference this year what's a little bit hard to know is the card market came off such an unbelievable run-up um that you know you've seen uh huge price declines in lots of areas so I think sentiment around cards is a little down. You know, you've got uh, people that have purchased stuff and, and they're sort of sitting on losses in many cases. Um, so that kind of slows the market down versus when it was so hot. But, you know, but how, do you, we'll how really... do you define their losses, though, David? Why, why is it a loss? If I'm investing in something and I want to hold on to it, who says it's a loss? How come I just can't buy it and hold it and say this is what I love and I want to keep? Well, I, I mean, I you can I don't do look that, at it from but... a monetary standpoint. I mean, the monetary standpoint of what it it cost me to acquire it. Now I've acquired uh, it. It's in my collection. It's no longer a loss to me. It's it's a value to me. Well, there's a lot of people that treat it that way, but there was so much hot money that came into cards and you routinely see uh, people buying and selling cards they just purchased um, mm -hmm. and or purchased two months ago uh, or six months ago, right? So like I'm somebody that I agree with you. Like if I buy something, hey, listen, I bought some stuff the last couple of years that I'm down big on, right? It's, 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 a, it's a loss on paper. I, I don't need to sell it. I'm not going to sell it. But a huge amount of the volume in the market has been people flipping cards. Yeah. So, and, and so if people are flipping and losing, um, you know, it takes some of the gas out of the market. You know, one of the things that helped fuel the run-up was people were flipping and making huge money. I mean, some of these guys I've known, from the PSA message board that were uh, baseball and basketball type collectors, not wrestling. Um, I mean, some of the rates of return they made on Jordans, Mickey Mantles, you know, were just staggering. Yeah. So when they, when they would turn that over, it gave them more buying power and then they could put more money into cards. Right. So if you have sort of a shrinking value base um, it just gives people less ammunition to play with. So I think wrestling is, is different in the sense that, outside of 
a recent phenomenon with some of the new products. A lot of people buy this stuff to keep, you know, and actually wrestling that's always been of, that way. I think that's the thing with wrestling period. People have always been uh, buying to keep, you know, you find something rare hit in the market, you better grab it because a lot of times you're not going to see it again for a long, long time because wrestling card collectors tend to hold on to their stuff for a very, very long time. Now, why, um, why is why is that? Would you guys guess? I mean, Dave, we're in the same position. I, I don't sell anything just because I like it. I've, I've collected it. I, you know, I don't need the money. I, I want to keep it. You have, God knows, 30 top grade Hulk Hogan's. You could get rid of them, but you don't because you like them and you don't have to sell them, you know, but but why is that? Why 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 is wrestling different, you guys figure? Well, part of it is it's not a um, a sport like baseball where you have to worry about somebody like getting, uh, take a Wander Franco, I believe was his name, mm -hmm. uh, super hot prospect, uh, awesome baseball player. All of a sudden he's tied up in some, stuff in the Dominican Republic with underage women, you know, we'll see how that plays out for him. Um, that that's the type of thing that can happen in baseball. Uh, but it they, happens they, in wrestling too, but you get these guys who are just, they appear to be bulletproof. I mean, well, Hogan, <laughs> but, Hogan, we, but you, Hogan, Hogan's, Hogan's one of them and flair's another one of them. And these guys got Hogan has a lot of any value and he, you know, nope, but, obviously but you didn't, you don't see like, it's not prospecting like, like Hulk no, Hogan no, or not. Rick Flair. Oh, okay. Not. Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair have a long history in the business. I'm talking about sort of the prospecting element, you know, basketball yeah. dur during the finals. Um, if, if a guy scores 42 points that night, his card gets hot on eBay. Yeah. Wrestling's not like that. We don't get those stats. No. I mean, look, look at like a guy like Roman Reigns. Like if he wins at WrestleMania, it doesn't make his card more valuable or less valuable, right? Being in the match might make it more valuable because he's sort of the top guy. But the win loss record is is not really that important. It's irrelevant. So, no, it's it's you, you touch upon an important point. I think it's longitudinal. So in other words, over time you build that following, you build that equity in your character and in your card brand. So a, a Flair, a Hogan, um, guys that were around a while, your Stings and this kind of thing, um, do that. But it's interesting because obviously when Panini um, hit hit the market, we had a lot of people come in that were looking to flip and invest. So let's move on to that. Um, Actually, at part two, but we're going to skip to part three just because we're on that now. The Panini yeah. era. Dave, talk about the the good, the bad, and the ugly. What all happened there, and and where do you think we're going to uh, go with tops taking over? Well, I think on the margin, Panini's been good for wrestling cards. Um, I, I they have put out uh, a lot of product. It gave collectors new stuff to access. Um, good uh, design in many cases. Um, Undertaker autographs, Hulk Hogan. I mean, you had um, uh, some of the, the rare insert paninis that have obviously brought um, a lot of attention and, and, and high sales. I think the challenge with panini um, for me is I was incredibly excited uh, when Prism launched. I was like, wow, this is awesome for wrestling cards. We're getting um, headline news. And it was just so strange that so much product ended up in and breakers and flippers hands and so i had never seen anything like that you know it, it immediately um i'll give you the example so braun when i i opened a box and right before it launched and um i had been reading on blowout you know some of the threads because there was a lot of uh, talk leading up to the product and people were sort of speculating that a braun breaker would be like a 40 to 80 dollar car so when I pulled his base card, I was like legitimately excited. I'm like, oh, sweet. Let's pull like a $40 card. Well, the, the first day that it launched um, right away on eBay, there was one that was an auction and it got up to like 90 something dollars um, with some, some time to go. You started seeing people listing them at buy it now at $49, $24. Um, and so immediately I, I, was on Twitter and I said, listen, you know, we've got a problem here. Uh, you're having people undercut the market immediately. That means there's going to be more sellers than buyers. Um, you know, my background is in economics and I've always approached cards from sort of an economics viewpoint. I'm not saying it's only the only right way, but that's just how I look at it. And so we sort of saw this avalanche of supply. Uh, then, you know, we saw what I felt like were astronomical asking prices, you know, $25,000 for a Roman Reigns and John Cena, you know, signed card. 
And I just didn't personally believe that there was the depth of collectors with that kind of pocketbook that could support the prices. You know, like one of the things that I guess I'm sort of most proud of, of my collection is I didn't pay a lot of money for the cards. Um, admittedly, I wouldn't buy my collection from me at the price that theoretically it's worth. Right. Like I, I, I don't nobody needs 30 Hulk Hogan's, but the price point I'm in them i don't have the motivation to sell right well this was people were going to have to to enter the market at twenty five thousand. and if you look at the number of wrestling cards at that time that had even sold for a thousand dollars um there wasn't that many and so to all of a sudden have you know this card's a thousand this one's five thousand this one's fifty thousand this one's a hundred thousand i just yeah, didn't especially think on, especially on unproven names too Gable Stevenson Black going for 15000 The guy had never wrestled yep. once. You know, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, that obviously has proved out, at least early on, that was probably a horrible purchase if that, you know, sale took place. But just in general, I mean, like, okay, like uh, an Undertaker autograph is $4,000. Well, he's got a War Booty autograph um, that at the time might have been, you know, four to $600. Mm -hmm. So the, the prices were just so much higher than – than I was used to. So um, I do think it obviously caused um, drama online. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, it became a, a hotly contested uh, topic of conversation. And, and I call, it, I know, call it the spark, the moment, you know, right. the, the, the big bang. <laughs> was that this this time that you're talking about when when all of a sudden this was happening and me, you and some other people were looking at it one way and a group of us were looking at it quite the other. And it was tough to reconcile the two. But let me let me touch on a couple of things quickly with your Undertaker reference, just because it's come up before. Do you think you said it was a good thing, the Undertaker, uh, having so many of them? We've heard the opposite. And in fact, we heard that with Mike the Cleaner last last uh, our last episode that them putting out so many Undertaker autographs wasn't a good thing. And in fact, it devalues uh, the Undertaker autograph. And then the second question you can play off of that was. When, you know, we called it a pump and dump, whether it was or wasn't, that's subject to to theory, theorists to decide. But if there was an oversupply at that moment, why did the boxes continue to go up? You know, so these are two two things that sort of. That don't, um, you know. Well, first of all, the boxes didn't keep going up. They, they, no, they, did, they, they did in the short term. No, no, no. They, I, they, I, they, I think that that stuff, that box price was up like I was a 48 hour window of box prices yeah. going up and it came down right after that. Immediately. So, so you're saying um, after that, that was when people. Oh, no, no. Here's what they debuted at like twelve hundred dollars. They went to fifteen hundred dollars for like a day and a half. And then all of a sudden it was down from there. Uh, within two weeks, they were under a, like under eight hundred. And then the then the big, you know, fall sort of just yeah, continued. And, and, and now look where we're at. Three times. Three times. Now look where we're at. We're at the yeah, that's three times as much to work today. Right. Yeah. When I say it's good for Undertaker, I'm just talking from a collector standpoint, you know, like like I, I, from a supply and demand standpoint, it's obviously bad. I mean, listen, if you've got so one of the basis um, uh, demand determinants, as it's called in, in economics, is close substitutes. Um, when all of a sudden you have all these close substitutes easily replaceable, um, you know, that's one of the things where I do where I also sort of question um, the long term on some of the Panini products is there's just so many to choose from. Like, so the closest thing that I have to that is say a Brock Lesnar, um, his football cards from 2004 and the leaf rookies and stars. There's like, I don't even know, 12 or 14 different versions of the, of the Brock. Now it's, it's goes from not numbered to 999 all the way down to 25. Well, a lot of people don't have to have the lowest print card. Like I, they would like it, but it's not like, I mean, they don't have to have it. And so all of a sudden it's like, well, I just want a Brock football card. Well, okay. Then they'll, they'll gravitate, let's say to the one that's got 999 copies. Well, um, you know, so with Panini, if there's a, a rock one of one, okay, that's a bragging rights piece. Naturally, somebody gets to say they have the, 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 the Willy Wonka golden ticket or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting into 99 and, and 249 and so on, um, there's just not enough collectors out there to support those at high prices, right? So I just think in the case of The Undertaker, you know, we there's two ways to look at the hobby. I mean, some people like to, just to collect, like you, you've been a completist, you want to own the stuff. Other people are constantly evaluating, hey, what's the value of this card? Like, did I buy it? 
at a good time? Did I buy it at a bad time? And Mike, the cleaner is accurate that uh, an overabundance of these autographs is certainly going to pressure the price lower. Um, but but you can look at that as a positive. Like now, all of a sudden, you might be able to afford um, four or five different versions of the Undertaker. So it's you know it just depends on how you look at it, I suppose. Let's let's look at that Black Rock because you just mentioned it, and I I, I don't want the thought to go to my head. You know, at the time, all of us were jumping up and down when it went to one hundred twenty five thousand um, dollars. I remember. You you said that it was a non-event. Um, do you still feel that way? Well, I, I think it was a non-event for wrestling cards. Yes, I do. Because it, it the, the guy who wanted on social media um, it was not a wrestling card collector. Um, I, I would argue... You're speculating, you, you, you reckon? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Rock is a crossover person. Uh, he's, he's a pop culture phenomenon. You know, he's a personality. Um, you know, one of the reasons I, I thought the 82 Hogan was going to do well uh, was Hulk is a pop culture icon. Um, Dick Murdoch, nobody cares about other than wrestling collectors, right? So maybe a Dick Murdoch in nice condition might sell for some good money, um, but a baseball card collector is not going to go buy a Dick Murdoch uh, in mass. Maybe there's one or two that do. Um, so the rock sale, I just didn't think was going to have any sort of magical um, impact on wrestling cards. Now, you could argue that it's cool that a wrestling card uh, sold for you know a spectacular number but it's not i mean look what happened afterwards the the rock gold uh people were you know patting themselves on the back thirty five thousand looks like a steal and just a few months later one of them went for eleven thousand and ten so it had no meaningful long-term impact just because it was a unicorn yeah i think so but one and i mean I, I, unicorns it, true it, it was cool. I mean, listen, I, I can tell you this right now. I mean, I never in my wildest dreams thought uh, the card would sell for that. I, I I think, and this is just my opinion, I think after seeing the rock gold uh, tumble to the degree it did, um, the odds don't favor that, that that rock would sell for 125 today. Maybe no, it would. No, I don't uh, think so. Well, I, I think we're all in agreement on that. Yeah. You know, no one's got a crystal ball to say how much, but, I, you know, that, that, that was an outlier for sure. But it was a moment, you know what I mean? Like all of a sudden, and it brought a little bit of attention. We had TMZ. It did. So yeah, it was, yeah. It was, you start, start making national news on that. It's a, it, it does nothing but, you know, help uh, spread more, you know, put more eyeballs on, on the market, uh, on our hobby. Okay, David, we're going, we were talking about Panini. We know that uh, Fanatics is getting the license, you know. Um, you sent me that video with Brian Gray this morning. That was very interesting because he was talking about it, it, the latest round being a draw, but we know that ultimately it's going to be a battle between Fanatics and uh, and panini directly um where do you see that going you know the 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 coming back to tops and getting into the fanatics era where they're going to be running the entire hobby and of course our little sex segment as well well i think there's a couple things um that are that sort of interest me so um i i had it this was kind of a fun story we had a pest control uh guy come over last week and i, I guess they have a sales rep and then you get a the, the person that actually comes out and does it. So anyway, the guy, you know, it was going to be an easy sell. We saw a couple of cockroaches. My wife called him, you know, we needed to get pest control. Well, he starts talking to me and tells me that, you know, he's, he's an entrepreneur that he opened up some card shops and, and I let him go for a <laughs> while be, before disclosing that I collect cards. Right. And all the bars um, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, he, um he's got, uh, some shops. So I live in Orlando and Melbourne, Florida um, is about 70 miles away from Orlando. It's, it's over kind of near Cocoa beach. People have probably heard of that maybe more. Um, but anyway, he opened up uh, a gaming store. So for the most part, Pokemon, but he's got uh, baseball, basketball, wrestling to some degree. Um, and one of the things we got to talking about was the P Panini with redemptions. And he said that it's just been a total nightmare you know, because he had he had pulled some major basketball redemption and it took him like two years for Panini to get it right. Um, he says that Panini had stopped sending product to them, like to the distributors in general, um, and that so many people are so angry with Panini uh, for the, the, the redemption situation. Right. So I think with one of the things I've never sort of understood was the redemption nature. I kind of feel like it, it when you when you pull a a card out of a pack would be pretty sweet if you just got the card, but I'm sure there's some rationale as to why they do it. Um, 
But that said, Panini has a sort of bad reputation across um, card shops and, and dealers and, and collectors for that matter um, for these redemption issues. And so I think we're tops um, and they may have, they, I've, you know, they recently had an issue where they double printed super refractors and on their Bowman product. I mean, obviously that is not a good look. Um, they made a hell of a, a, a good pivot by offering to buy them off the market, which basically kind of creates a chase factor that all of a sudden XYZ super refractors worth 25 grand and tops will pay that. Um, but so I think it's going to be um, hopefully a positive. I, my, my hope um, is that they're going to make some cool products. I think historically people have been comfortable with the tops um, name. Um, the other thing is, uh, is fanatics is incredibly well capitalized. Um, the valuation on that business uh, last I had heard was something like 27 billion. Now that's Nothing. a private company. So, it, you know, sometimes those things are hard to know. Like if it actually came to the stock exchange, can it, can it you know, sustain that? But the last round of, of funding was at a really high value. So I think the um, what I'm hearing is that they're going to take wrestling seriously. Um, I hope that's the case. And, um, you know, maybe they'll have some on-card autos. I think some, you know, super refractor type cards that um, would be really cool. You know, one of the cards I actually think is probably one of the best wrestling cards out there is that Roman Reigns. He's got like this one of one signed super refractor. I mean, that's pretty badass when you think about it. I mean, you know, that's a, that, that's a cool card. So I'm hoping they, they bring some stuff like that, but, the bigger issue is I'm just hoping they treat collectors fairly. Um, that to me is, you know, when, when me and the pest control guy were talking, I'm like, how pissed off would you be if you spent $6,000 on this super high end panini box and then you can't get them to send you the card? Like, that's just bad business. That's not cool, you know? And, and but let's uh, also and, keep in mind, too, uh, Tops is not, they're not uh, foreign to, to, you know, to, to redemptions either. So, uh, oh, I'm just saying. I'm just saying in general. Like, I mean, I, to the best of my knowledge, yeah, a super yeah. refractor you pull out of a pack, right? Cur yeah, yeah. So I just think that if there's some big chase cards in the pack, where you know, because like I, I, I got, um, I pulled a uh, Alexa Bliss redemption, and 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 my redemption with Panini went smooth, so it, it came out quick. Yeah. But I, I admittedly would have thought it was way cooler if I pulled the Alexa Bliss versus this white piece of paper with some codes on. it. Well, we know sometimes the cards aren't even made when the set comes out, and that's what the redemptions are for, and they're waiting for WrestleMania for everyone to get together in one group, yeah. and then you get the triples, uh, autographs, and things like that. What do you think about price points, David? Do you think now that Panini has come on the scene, they've had, you know, higher uh, price-pointed sets, you know, things like Impeccable and uh, uh, Immaculate, do you think we're going to see more of that on the Fanatic slash top side? Well, um, that Topps Transcendent that came out years ago was a super expensive box. Yeah. Um, that delivered some of the coolest uh, Vince McMahon autographs on the market. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I would imagine that's what they're going to do. I mean, the the what's what's changed so much in the hobby is base cards. You know, unfortunately, just don't carry that much value. Um, base and cards never really have. I mean, even going back to comic image uh, days, they never really have. It, base has never been the place to go for stuff unless you're looking for those rookies or first appearances. I mean, that's that's been forever. Well, I mean, in the hobby, like baseball, basketball, et cetera. Uh -huh. I mean, like a, a Michael Jordan 86 Fleer is a base yeah. card. Sure, there's but a we, don't, we don't have that. It's what's different about wrestling. We don't have that kind of stuff. It's never existed in, in, in our hobby, really. It's not a big deal to have this base card um issue uh people want the numbered stuff limited stuff autograph stuff relic stuff it's always kind right. of been the case for this hobby but in order to sell boxes at high price points you need that that's that's well, the point. yeah you need that and that's like but we're not going to see like if people think that going back to top we're going to have 65 75 dollar chrome boxes again that ain't happening no, but I mean, if you look at, for example, Panini Prism was was listed at one hundred thirty dollars. That was the MSRP out of the gate, right? One fifty, yeah. One thirty. Yeah. Um. So, so that said, that's a relatively affordable price point. Uh, Tops Transcendent. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, was something like twelve thousand dollars. Thirteen grand for a box of Transcendent. Okay. So that so if you think about one hundred and thirty dollars and thirteen thousand, that's a huge range. Sure. Um, I would suspect. 
that they'd be probably playing in the $400 range, $600 range. Um, I, I, I'm not, uh, no idea, but my assumption will be that they would, in order to attract collector interest, you're going to have to put out higher end products because nobody cares about base cards. Um, and if you look at like Panini, just for argument's sake, uh, the, the prism stuff is just continued. I mean, what's a box now? 200 bucks. Um, 250 to six to between that 250, so, so 275. So okay. it never actually so, got down to that suggested price. If you think about it, yeah, so the MRS but, was but, like 130. It never really dipped below 200. So that showed the sustainability of the boxes, even to this day, even on the secondary stuff, you know, we're not just talking about the first prism box, but all but the like the, the, the odds of it going back to a thousand dollars, I'd put it zero. Um, of course. And, yeah. Oh yeah. And, Those days are, you over. know, I mean, I just think it's, and so, but the thing is, is that the contents have to drive the price. I mean, if, if you're buying stuff where nobody can recoup their investment, right. then you lose interest, right? So they're going to have to do some cool stuff to, um, to move product. And I think they, you know, to the best of my knowledge, I would assume they plan to. What about Leaf? They've been in the news lately. You know, they seem to be increasing their profile. We'll talk about Leaf and Upper Deck together because, you know, they're they're the other two. What are your thoughts on those two companies and where they fit in going to the future? Um, well, the Leaf situation with the, the Dwayne Johnson is an incredibly fascinating one. Um, I don't think we really know exactly the whole story. Um, it appears there's 30 signed stickers. And so if that's the case, um, those are going to be sought after, but it's also, I think those are going to be not necessarily just wrestling collectors. I think Dwayne Johnson has, you know, some, some, some big appeal, isn't it in pop century? So it's kind of like a pop culture set. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, you know, Leaf had done those autographed uh, sketch cards some years back. I think, you know, people seem to like those. Um, I, I never really gravitated towards them. Um, Upper Deck, I mean, I just saw Joey Graben had uh, posted or purchased uh, uh, an expensive uh, one of one of MJF. And mm -hmm. I think the design of those cards is fantastic. I mean, they're a very visually appealing card. I think the sort of the drawback is, you know, AEW doesn't have Roman Reigns, um, mm -hmm. you know, do does have John Cena or Hulk Hogan, et cetera. So, um, you know, but I, I, I think that stuff's good. I mean, it's it's great that uh, that they're making that. And, you know, you've also I, I just recently saw like a upper deck Cody Rhodes. Some of his rare um, cards have sold pretty well, yeah. um, you know, so I think it's great. Cool. Um, let's move on then to uh, autographs, because there was a little bit of controversy earlier this year where, you know, we, we started talking about the WCW. We did a bunch of shows and. You were what you were sort of on the front line saying, "Hey guys, you know, take a step back and realize that you shouldn't assume that just because a, rest, a, a product is signed that it's going to be legit." And you weren't saying anything more than that. That you were just just quit questioning some of the authenticity, um, you know. And then we get into degrees. Well, how much of this is fake? How much of this set is 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 potentially not real? Um, Talk about the legitimacy of certain wrestlers and, and autos across the board. There are some that you feel that are more likely to not be real. And uh, let's get into that a little bit more so that you can sort of not defend yourself, but just talk on that subject that we've already talked to death. Yeah, um, there was never any intent to um, delegitimize de uh, the entire WCW set. Um, for many, many years, uh, people have questioned the Hulk Hogan's. Uh, part of that is there's just... I think there's four or five different versions. Some of them. Um, well, I, I think, quite frankly, um, if I had to bet, I'd say the vast majority of the set's real. Uh, I don't think that that's ever been in question. What's what's gotten sort of more complicated is when some of the wrestlers are like, hey, you know, that's uh, as Buff Bagwell, that's not my B. Um you know, I, I don't know. That's what he said, right? So, yeah, I know, but I, think, I can't I can't trust the guy who can't remember last weekend, let alone last, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Well, um, so for example, uh there's a guy who's a great collector, he goes by Bandino uh on Justin, yeah. Uh, yeah. Twitter. Yeah. yeah. He did a private signing with Hulk and asked Hulk uh about the WCW autographs, and Hulk has no recollection of signing them. Uh, he knew everything about his other cards. Now, that's not to say that they're not real, um, but Hulk is very knowledgeable about his collector or collectibles. 
um, and had no recollection of signing him. The only reason I even thought that the the Hogan's um, might not be is one, I just don't think that the signatures look like a lot of his other ones. But two, uh, and Tony, matter of fact, I think it was you who posted the photo uh, of a uh, that was a Hollywood Hogan uh, that Linda used to sign all those. So yep. to me, to me, I just think that the uh, odds don't favor that Hulk would have sat there and signed two thousand cards. Um, maybe he did. Um, you know, on the flip side. I've, I've seen like a sting. I think the sting is as perfect as it gets. Um, another sort of interesting story is like uh, Joey Upchurch. He's a, a real nice guy in the hobby. Um, and he's the one that, uh, you know, had talked to, to Buff. Um, he ran into Arn Anderson recently um, at a show. And, you know, Arn didn't remember signing him, but his son's like, oh, yeah, dad, we've got a bunch of those at home. So that's where it gets even more murky is that, you know, we hear that they were signed backstage. Um, we also uh, see that a lot of the collectors or not the collectors, but the wrestlers in the sets have a bunch of them that are uh, unsigned. Um, you know, we saw and uh, like when I helped uh, the referee, Charles Robinson, with um, sort of getting the word out that he had a British bulldog uh, last year. You know, he had all these unsigned Steve Mongo McMichaels that nobody had ever seen. Um, Tony, you introduced the Rey Mysterios to the market. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've seen Booker T's that obviously were not mailed back in. So I just think there's um, you just can't be 100 percent. And the reality of it is, is we say the same thing about the wrestling all stars cards. OK, because that'll be the quick. Oh, well, what about those? Honestly, there's some autographs. And those that are probably authenticated that aren't real. Um, I think autographs in general um, are such a tough category because there's so many factors in what causes the autograph the signature to look the way it does. Uh, is the person in a hurry? Are they in a good mood? Are they in a bad mood? Um, did the pen work good? Um, you know, how was the angling of their hand? You know, like if you look, uh, like take Andre the Giant there's a huge range of what his signature looks like. Was he intoxicated? <laughs> uh, was it earlier in his career? How many um, bottles of wine? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think autographs there, my take is there just has to be, always be a little bit of suspension of disbelief. If you didn't see it signed, um, you just don't a hundred percent. know. Uh, I think that the reality of it is most of the time, like, like take the staying autograph that looks perfect. Bret Hart looks perfect. Uh, they don't have a lot of variance in their signature, but some people do. You know, I've seen the Chris Benoit's, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you look at five of those next to each other, uh, it's hard to say they all look like they're signed by the same person. But they they most likely are. But if you didn't see it happen, you know, you're not always. A, it's just not 100 percent. That, that's I got, that's where I, got, I stand. Got a few of those Benoit's sitting around here in the store. Well, I mean, the, here's the thing about Benoit is and that's. Back to your earlier point of of uh, like that you sort of can't hurt your reputation. Ben Watts stuff sells pretty good. It still <laughs> sells well, of course. It sells real well. It sells um, really well. You know, I mean, uh, when I was buying uh, lots of box that, remember I was doing. Um, I also started selling a, adult trading cards, and I had someone who wanted a bunch of these uh, girls of of um, uh, of Wicked uh, series twos. And so he's like, yeah, I'd like to get, um, you know, a, a full to a 12 box case. I said, yeah, I, I can, I can get those for you at the time. So I, yeah. And I'll, I'll trade you a bunch of WCW autographs for it. Well, hell yeah. I will definitely trade you because I'm buying that case for $468 for a case. Every single box has one to two autographs in it. Have your, have at it, man. And I'll trade you the Eddie, the Chris Benoit. I'm like, I'll take all that stuff. That stuff still sells really well. You're, you're talking about the adult stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about, uh, you know, even the WCW stuff. I made a trade with somebody for adult cars. Like, he's willing to go and get the adult stuff. But I knew that the uh, Chris Benoit car was still going to hold high value. It just oh, yeah. didn't matter. I mean, no matter what you think about him, that stuff, that one car would have paid for the paid for the whole case of adult cars I traded this guy. Well, the thing about the WCW set, too, is I, I think it, it's a very important set because you have to think back in, uh, in the, the time that NWO – you know, took over wrestling for that period of time, um, it chronicles that window. And, you know, Hollywood Hogan um, and the NWO and, and, and all the, the wrestlers that, that, you know, got involved, 
that was a big deal. I mean, if you look at the history of wrestling, you know, they changed the game. Um, and, and so there's, a, it's got a great checklist. Um, it's got great mystique behind it as far as some of the people didn't send them in. Um, and I would argue it's, it's every bit, I mean, potentially more collected than the wrestling all-stars, right? I mean, I, there is some diehard, uh, completest like, you know, Paul, I think, would you have 105 or 106 or something like that? 107 now, right? Okay. I mean, but think about that. That's, that's, that's hard to put together. Um, well, I, I did it. Like, I did it over. I did it over the entire time. There's some guys that have just started this link like a year, a year or two ago, and have amassed these massive collections. But I, yeah. I think that the upshot, the long and short of it, David, is is what you're saying is just keep an open mind. Is that yeah, I just necessarily black and white. Sometimes there are gray areas, and it's okay to question these things. It's just you know, and I mentioned to this this to you offline is that um, you know, your 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 voice carries. So, you know, whether you intend to or not, when you make a statement, it gets heard probably more so than anyone else in the hobby. That's why sometimes I might go offline and say, well, let's temper this, you know, instead of being so uh, blunt or something. Um, but I get what you're saying. You know, they're like like nothing's for sure. And there's nothing wrong with asking questions. I mean, it's it's ultimately what gets us to these answers, I think, if you start questioning these, these things. Well, I, I think the thing that people just have, the sports card hobby, trading card hobby, there's a lot of shady stuff historically that's taken place, right? Right. I mean, sports memorabilia in general. So if, if you're if you're just approaching the memorabilia market with with hey, everything is real, um, I think that's the wrong approach because ultimately, I mean, like take and I I have no proof if this is the case or not, but Lucha Donick, I don't know if I pronounced his name right, but there's great speculation that his mom has been signing the cards in those packs. I mean, there has been lots of examples of uh, cards being mailed back, signed by somebody else over the years in, in some of these products. So, you know, it's a um, it's you just have to, to keep your eyes open. I mean, I think uh, the reality of it is, is that if something looks good to you, um, great. If it if it doesn't look good to somebody else, that's fine, too. Um, I just don't approach everything as, you know, everything is always perfect all the time. That's, that's my take. Gotcha. Before we get off that's autographs, cool. let's, let's talk about Fitterman. What are your thoughts on that? Because you've made a few interesting comments that, Hey, if you got to pay Fitterman prices for a flair or an undertaker, um, you know, uh, that sets a value to past product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's going on with that? You know, I, I understand the Fitterman angle, right? The guy's a business guy um i saw rick flair on some video was talking about you know he's making more money now than he ever has thanks to fitterman um you know sports i'm not a fan of um restricting like cards to be signed um i understand them charging more okay you want to you know you want to charge a premium price okay be my guest um but just saying hey we won't sign them and then him going on ebay and buying a bunch of them, he gets them signed, mm -hmm. he right. gets them authenticated, then he puts them on eBay. Right. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I get it. It's a business decision. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I side with um, the talent in this situation. So, so we've seen now there's a lot of signed 82 Hogan's, right? Uh, but, early, you know, I got my first ones done um in 2011 and then i got some done in person in 2012 hulk was not happy to be signing that card for 60 dollars a piece at the time um he, he just was not right and and so what they did is they said okay we look on ebay we see what's happening in the secondary market he needs to get paid more right because if if dave shows up with a card and pays 60 bucks and all of a sudden immediately that autographs let's say worth makes the card worth Four hundred dollars more. Um, that's a really good value proposition for me. So for the the talent to want a bigger piece of the pie, I understand that, right? But what's happened now with Fitterman is they've raised the prices so high that it's actually a losing proposition. Um, you you get an Undertaker card signed at at two hundred forty dollars, then you pay PSA another thirty five dollars, um, whatever the card costs. And they're selling well below that. And so, you know, some people make the argument, well, it's the experience, it's in person. 
a lot of these Fitterman signings are mail-in signings, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, I would love to get some Brock Lesnar football card signed. They were trying to get, they, they were $500 a pop. Well, guess what happened? The first one that came to market sold for like 260. Okay. I, I don't do everything for money, but I don't like to just throw it away. Like I'm not spending 500 knowing it's worth 250. Um, now if I got to meet Brock, you know, and shake his hand and do a photo op, you know, I might, but in a mail-in signing, I don't want to just throw money out the window. Do you think the situation gets worse with time or better? Well, probably worse. And I'll tell you, uh, well, in terms of more people wanting to work with Fitterman, yes, because I mean, there's been talk that, um, that Hogan was going to sign with uh, uh, fanatics um, I think you're going to you I would not surprise me if Fanatics starts doing some stuff like that as far as, you know, they got the deep pockets. They could they could outbid some of these um, agents. Um, but I mean, let's face it. John Cena is with Fitterman now. Undertaker, uh, Ric Flair. He's done Hulk Hogan. Well, um, every every contracted WWE person who does live appearances is under contract with Fitterman. It's part of their arrangements. So okay. WWE used to ha WWE used to handle you know, bookings for talent and would charge you, you know, uh, $40,000 for an appearance for two hours for John Cena at a wizard world convention and stuff like that. I, I think that they just sort of, you know, said, you know what, uh, and it's somebody, cause I, I deal with the contracts with some of these talents for some people that I rep for. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's basically WWE went out and they hired a me and said, you deal with this. Here's what we want from it. You go ahead and Add more if you want to make your money like that. You just handle all the bookings. We don't want to deal with this anymore. And that's what Fitterman kind of stepped in and said, sign that contract with Undertaker being the first guy. And then it became exclusively for all WWE on-air talent. Okay. Well, the thing I've also noticed is um, at the wrestling conventions, I mean, all the all the talent wants more uh, further autographs these days. And, you know, listen, I mean, I get it. That's that's their likelihood. Uh, for many of them, it's it's how they make their money. Um, and so, uh, you know, like if you're a retired wrestler, you know, and, and let's say the booking fee, you know, cause I know some of them are, you know, as low as $500, obviously it goes up a lot from there, but if, if Greg Valentine, just for argument's sake, can get 3000 for his booking fee versus 2000, he was, he's going to want to do that. And, and so we've just seen at the conventions the last couple of years, I mean, even the honky tonk man wants like 50 or 60 bucks, you know, to sign a card. So um, I, I think that trend is is probably still going up. Yeah, let's talk about future MVPs before we get into all stars and wrap things up. Is there any names that you're hot on today? And are you watching the current product? Are you watching Raw and, and SmackDown and keeping up with who's who and what's what? And is there anybody that sort of floats your boat as being a big star? Like we talk about Rhea Ripley for one. Are there any other names that sort of uh, you're kind of bullish on? You know, um, I have a real hard time sitting there for three hours watching raw. Like I, 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 I can't really do it. Um, I, I, I wish I could, but it just, um, it's just, I'd rather spend that time say watching, you know, old YouTube videos. Um, but I think that wrestling today is, I, you could argue as popular as ever. I mean, the, the, the ratings, you know, uh, obviously TV ratings matter, but I mean, if you look at the social media, um, ratings, the YouTube ratings. I mean, the number of sort of impressions is just off the charts, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I follow it a lot, you know, through the Twitter feed, right? And, you know, watch the, you know, highlights, stuff like that. Um, Rhea Ripley is obviously um, uh, the hot female wrestler at the time. Um, you know, she's impressive in the ring. Um, you know, hopefully for her sake, uh, you know, she can stay injury free because, you know, one of the things that can happen is, you know, when you're on a tremendous run like she is, um, if you get injured, then all of a sudden you're off TV for a while. You know, you can just kind of get cold and it's hard to work your way back into the um, side out of immediate. Mind. Yeah, they're just exactly. You know, look, I mean, I, we've seen I think it's been amazing watching MJF develop. You know, it's funny. The first uh, podcast I did um, might have been like six years ago, something like that. Whenever AEW was first coming out, maybe it's only five years ago. I'm not sure, but I remember uh, Eric from the Fat Packs. That was the Beckett podcast. He's like, you know, we got to talking about current wrestling, and I was like, man, you know, this AEW—they've got this guy named MJF. 
I was like, this guy is unbelievable on the mic. Um, I mean, he is, he can cut a hell of a promo. Um, and so I've seen a lot of these guys buy the indie cards. Um, I think that's amazing. It's great for the hobby that people work so hard to get uh, the third party graders to authenticate them. That just, you know, card grading is not for everybody, but it takes the stakes up so much. Um, and it, it, it sort of becomes like a rising tide lifts all boats in that scenario. I mean, take that, um, I guess it's called limitless and there's an MJF and they're sort of debating whether there's 20 or 25, you know, when, when, when um, Tony O from Wisconsin uh, graded out one and nine, um, you know, he had a home run selling it to Joey Graven. Right. And mm-hmm. it was a great, a great win for them, but it was a great win for the hobby because ultimately um, it legitimizes the interest in MJF cards. Um, it, it also makes um, the, I don't care what anybody says. There's a profit motive out there in the trading card world. I mean, in 1985, when I was ripping open a Topps baseball pack, trying to get a Dwight Gooden, I paid 50 cents for the pack. I was hoping to get a $15 Dwight Gooden. You know, that, every time the Beckett came out, everybody was dying to see if there was up arrows or down arrows on their cards, right? Like, you know, it, it, it's it's just always been sort of part of the bigger part of the hobby. And so to have, you know, an MJF, uh, rare sort of minor league type card sell for big money and then have an upper deck um, short print sell for big money. I think it's great. Now in terms of uh, me scouting out current talent, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not really good at that. I mean, I think a guy like Cody Rhodes um, could uh, prove to be um, a good investment perhaps. I mean, he's a, um, he's really impressed me with, not only his work ethic, but I think he's very good on the mic. He's also excellent with the fans. Um, that could drive interest, um, you know, by just people liking the guy. But, you know, wrestling's weird like that because MJF, you know, I, I this is where I got really bashed on <laughs> on social media. I didn't even know about it until sometime later. I found it on Instagram. But, you know, I don't like him throwing the, the cards or the um, yeah. figures. I, I, I find that to be disrespectful. Well, the reality of it is everybody's like, that's his, that's his gimmick and so on. And, and that's true to a point. But if I show up to an MJF signing with one of those limitless cards that somebody paid 3000 I don't want you throwing that shit, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm sorry. You, you know, I'm paying you to sign this, not destroy it. Um, we were, you know, and I've seen all kinds of things in the hobby when we were just at the Hogan signing a couple weeks ago and – you know, this was probably one of the toughest things I've ever seen happen. Um, my good friend Rob England had uh, cracked open a 1981 Poppy uh, PSA 8 to get signed by Hulk. And it went perfect. Hulk did an absolutely beautiful signature. But you have to hand them your cell phone. And so Rob kind of walked away and they're like, hey, you forgot your phone. Well, he went to reach for his phone and totally forgot that the card was in his, uh, on, on a, like sort of supported by a piece of paper and it fell and it hit the ground and destroyed one of the corners. And I mean, I, I just, I mean, my heart sank. I, 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 it was just so. We all cringe um, simultaneously. <laughs> oh, I, I was so, you know, I was really proud. Not even of there. I'm cringing. <laughs> yeah. He, he held it together so good afterwards. Like I wouldn't have, I would have been like, dude, guys, I'm going home. I, I would have been just, yeah. you would have, I, I probably would have been outside, you know, yelling F, you know, like, mm-hmm. I mean, it, and he, 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 he handled it well, but so that can happen, right? Like you can damage a card. It's not a guarantee when you crack a card out that it's going to, you know, stay in the same condition, but I don't want the talent on purpose ruin it. Sorry. So. Well, that, that, that's an interesting take. Um, we're going to wrap it up shortly because we're coming up to the hour market. Is there anything we need to talk about, All-Stars or PSA, like your domain that we haven't touched upon or anything going on recently that you want to comment on? You know, uh, um, the All-Stars just continue to um, be a popular set. Um, what I've found is that uh, a PSA 8 is now um, considered a good card. You know, me and Joey Graben kind of laughed because early on, you know, it was like nine or 10, that's all you wanted. Right. And, and um, it, it's, it's what's happened is I think people have sort of realized that um, an eight K 
can be a very, very attractive card. Um, P, or, well, just, but I mean, it's just, a, they're a nice looking card, you know? I mean, it's not like it's, it's garbage. Um, I think for PSA, um, I'm hoping to um, get a PSA submission going soon. I've been, um, you know, kind of on the sidelines from grading for a while. Um, I just, I, you know, sort of building up a stash and stuff. And, um, you know, my, my wife and I recently moved. And so now things are kind of settled down um, where I can kind of get in position. But, you know, I just, at the end of the day, um, you know, I like PSA. I'm a PSA guy. I think it's great that there's other companies like CSG is really uh, taking wrestling cards seriously. Um, we've seen like, I think it's Caleb, you know, he's running a, um, a grading, you know, service type deal where we'll send cards in for people. So we just got a lot of cool stuff happening in wrestling cards. And I think we're going to continue to build on the momentum. Um, the disagreements online, you know, I think that's re really sort of, unfortunately, just a natural part of the hobby. Um, if you look at like blowout forums, for example, and read, you know, baseball, basketball, disagreements have taken place, you know, name callings taken place. So I don't view that as the end of the world. I, I think we're in a good spot. I think we've got a lot of great collectors. Um, we've got a lot of momentum and, you know, I, I feel confident that, that, that's going to continue. You know what? That's a perfect place to drop off there. We could be talking for hours and hours. Perhaps we might have to do Tony, a uh, David Peck collector series volume two, but for now, let's more, uh, more than likely. Yeah. Let, let's <laughs> cut it there. David, thanks again for coming on. And thanks again for sharing your knowledge. I mean, there's not a lot of guys in this hobby that could sit and talk about everything there is to, is to talk about in wrestling as well as you. Um, not that anyone doesn't know, but let everyone know where they can find you and how. Yeah, so um, I'm on um, Instagram. I, I snagged the uh, handle 1982 Wrestling All Stars. I used to have like this little show and tell website, but um, I was terrible at making the, uh, that website builder work, and my traffic was terrible, so I just kind of let it go. Um, and then I'm um, I spend most of my time on Twitter. I, I think that Twitter. Um, is an incredible platform. I guess we could call it X now, but information travels rapidly. I think the, um, you know, it's really neat that you'll see some of the professional wrestlers um, interact with folks. Like I've seen Chris Jericho interact uh, with his um, 1993 card, the CMLL. I think I got yeah. that right. Um, so I'm, I'm DPEC 100 on Twitter. You find me on there all the time. Um, I, I respond to any comments I can. Um, only rules I have is, you know, d don't try to start arguments with me because I'm going to block you because this for me is a, a fun thing. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I try to just, we could disagree, but when people start with insults and things like that, it's see ya. Yep, that's the enough. natural progression. That's the natural progression of our hobby. I think, I mean, when you get to the big guys like baseball, basketball and football, that division and those kind of arguments came with the territory you know, and we, we asked to be taken seriously and acknowledged. And, uh, um, you know, here we are making some waves now finally within the hobby. And uh, it's just, it's a natural progression. I think it's an unfortunate progression, but yeah, it's, it's a sign that it's a sign that we've arrived, right? It's a, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I think it's, a, it is. Tony, where can people find you? I don't know. I'm, I'm nowhere to be found. I'm on uh, wrestling trading cards.com. Everything, uh, all of our social media handles can be found on the bottom of every single page in the site. Awesome guys. Thanks very much. Very, very, very informative discussion. My name is Paul Anand from Wrestling Card Price Guide. Tony Vella from WrestlingTradingCards.com. We bring you the WTC Collector Series every couple of weeks. We're having a great time doing it. We look forward to many more guests to come just to give you guys the knowledge uh, to go out there and have fun in the hobby. Um, great. Thanks again, guys. And thanks, everyone, for watching.